Great. Um, well, just as a reminder, uh, there are links below the webcast to access the gather.town during the break and after the session for networking, um, as well as a merch shop in case you want to get any uh, MIT Bitcoin Expo uh, swag. The next session we have up is the Central Bank Digital Currency Panel. Uh, I'd like to invite up to the stage our moderator, Nicholas Zhang, who is currently a grad student at, at MIT and a research scientist in CSAIL and MIT economics. He's interested in privacy preserving computations for economic and social design, such as auctions, matching, clearing and netting, as well as risk sharing agreements. He'll be joined by panelists Rob Ali and David Zhou. Hello and welcome to this panel on central bank digital currency. Um, so it is a slightly peculiar topic within the uh, MIT Bitcoin Expo, since uh, it must have not escaped your attention that there is central in central bank digital currencies. So it is a bit like the uh, Empire Strikes Back episode within the uh, Star Wars saga. So to discuss this topic, we have with us two of the brightest commentators within this space. So first, that Dr. David Tu Chuanbei, which is the uh, chief economist of Xiang blockchain. And um, previously, Dr. Zhu held various position in China Investment Corporation which is the sovereign wealth fund responsible for China's foreign reserve and Nanhu Finance Corporation from 2026 to 2019. So Dr. Zhu received his PhD in economics from Tsinghua University, which is uh, China's um, MIT, and did his mid-career MPA from Harvard University. And before that, he did his bachelor in economics and MA in economics and statistics from Beijing University, which is um, China's Harvard University. And um, so Dr. Zhu was the winner of several prizes, such as the Sun Yen Fund Prize for Financial Innovation, which is China's top prize for economists, and the fifth China Soft Science Prize for his research on fintech in general. And uh, he wrote several books, um, which got selected into the list of financial books of the year by the China Business Network, and was nominated one of the top 10 institutional economists of the year in 2019 by China Business Network. And um, if you're interested in central bank digital currency, I actually recommend you to follow him on Twitter and LinkedIn for his great uh, blog post. So that was on the Chinese side. On the Western side, we have Roble Ali, which, who is a founder of Wadasco Inc., which is a specialist company offering software engineering and public policy expertise to design, build, and performance test central bank digital currency. And before starting Wadasco, Roble led the CBDC research at the uh, MIT Digital Currency Initiative and prior to that, he led the digital currency work for the Bank of England. So that is the uh, introduction for our panel and for the topic, central bank digital currency. And um, yeah, so we have seen how central bank, like the unexpected adoption of central bank by, of the blockchain technology um, is a bit intriguing. So a good way to kickstart our discussion would be to ask both panelists on uh, what they think the, the main goals and objectives central bankers are trying to reach through adopting this technology. So who would like to start? So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to start. So uh, thank you, Nicholas, and to the uh, MIT uh, Bitcoin Expo for inviting me to speak today. I appreciate it. Um, it's good to be back after last year. Um, yeah, so what's the, the primary reason? I think for me, um, central banks are unique in the financial system and, you know, have always been in the sense that they both act to regulate the system and they're also a participant in the system. And I think um, for that reason, central banks have always evolved, uh, you know, since they first came into existence. So, the, the, you know, the first central banks came around in the 17th century and what the financial system is today is obviously quite different from what it was in the 17th century and central banks always have to adapt and evolve. And I think that you know, the research that central banks are doing now on central bank digital currency is a natural continuation of that um, evolution and research. And it's sort of, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an important part of what central banks do. They always conduct research. They always have to think about what the future of the financial system is going to look like and adapt. And I see it as part of that tradition. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Niklas. And... Uh, so I think uh, the payment uh, is a very important goal for the CBDC project. 
but, uh, uh, but as, as we know, payment has many layers. So on the top layers, you have a uh, wholesale payment. So some country I use and uh, wholesale CBDC to update their uh, wholesale payment system, like the real-time growth, growth and uh, settlement systems. Uh, the second layer is of course, and the, the retail payment systems. And, uh, and we know this is a very important topic and uh, in, in many countries. Uh, uh, so if you look at the case in America and uh, American still use lots of credit cards and the checks to, for payment and it's not real time. Uh, so, uh, the Federal Reserve has started a uh, uh, fast payment project called Fast Fed Now. Uh, but if you like the case of China, and uh, we have mobile payment service everywhere, so Chinese people don't don't use check, and uh, we don't use as much cash as before. Uh, so. So for the retail CBDC, and I think it has diff it will serve different goals in different countries. For example, in America, it could be a, a tools to pro provide fast payment. But however, in China, uh, the government consider that uh, retail CBDC to as a as a tool to level the playing field of the mobile payment market because uh, it is now dominated by big tech like. Alipay and, and uh, Tencent Pay. Uh, and, and also there are also a relationship between a retail CBDC and a physical cash. And so some countries move close to a cashless society like China and Sweden. And in those countries, the central bank wants to introduce re retail CBDC and just to give the central bank uh, presence in the, uh, in the payment sectors. Uh, the second tier of payment market is, of course, cross-border payments. And we have seen lots of uh, innovation in these areas, uh, and, uh, including and uh, stable coins such as Libras. But also uh, the CBDC are joined this, uh, this, uh, this direction. And, and we know and uh, both wholesale CBDC and the retail CBDC can be used to facilitate cross-border payments. Uh, but at this moment, and uh, there are lots of discussion whether we should use just use retail CBDC, much like uh, use Bitcoin to make cross-border payment. Uh, so this is of, uh, definitely one solution. Uh, but I think that another solution will become mainstream in the future. And uh, I attended the uh, Bank of International Settlement Innovation Summit last week. So there are lots of discussion on the multi-CBDC bridge and it's basically a, and, uh, a, a shared DLT to connect different wholesale CBDC projects. So last month, the Chinese Central Bank has worked with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the Central Bank of Thailand and the Central Bank of UAE to start a multi-CBDC project. I think there will be lots of innovation in these areas. Just uh, self different goals of uh, payment uh, modernization. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and so I'll build on to several of the points you 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 both mentioned. Uh, first is that Rubley, you said that central banks um, like it's part of their core mission to innovate. And um, relatedly, um, David, you said that um, one of the goal for the Chinese project is to level the the playing field uh, like with like within the like the payment ecosystem. So now that we have seen what like the objectives of um, CBDC like are, um, the next big questions we have like the, we would like to you to answer for our audience would be on how best to build like CBDCs. So, um, um, for instance, as you were saying that the, the Chinese government is trying to level the playing field like with all these big techs, um, do is like. And they're doing it with the public resource in, in comparison of these private like uh, tech firms. Um, so I wanted to point it out that um, E Chinese uh, Yuan has been in the workings for some times now. Um, like it's one of the longest standing projects and it's design changed many times. Like the rollover has been very cautious, like the proof of concept, like were issued in like, like specified cities. So, um, could you tell us a bit about um, like some of this like iteration like and some of the changes um, that, that the design might have had and what prompted them? Okay, uh, so uh, I think this is a very good question. And uh, 
so first of all, and we know we need to know that there are lots of flexibility in the design of CBC, both in terms of uh, the economic design and also in terms of technical choice. Uh, for example, there are wholesale CBDC and retail CBDC. And uh, CBDC can be token-based or account-based. And it can be just one tier, you know, the central bank directly face the public and it can be a two tier assistance. And uh, from central bank to commercial banks, then to the retail users. Uh, so uh, I, th I think there were a lot of uh, rule for innovation in the CBDC design. That's, we, that's, that's, we, that's why we see that there's so many different designs across the CBDC CBDC project in, in different countries. And also uh, in, in the same country, for example, China, and there are lots of and the change and in the course. Uh, and also uh, CBDC can serve many goals and, uh, and the government needs some time to work out the, the priorities and uh, work best for, for their country. So I think this uh, background is, we need to take this background into considerations when we observe the CBDC project. And uh, for the Chinese project, and it's now, it's, it's now actually and in the pilot testing and in intense cities around China. And the next year will be offered to foreign users in the Winter Olympic venues. And uh, actually, I'm personally, I am an active user of and, uh, the ECNY on my, on, my, on, my, on my wallet, on my phone. Uh, it's very convenient. So, uh, why the central bank has changed the design of the East and West? Uh, I think the most important one is about the public and private partnership design. Because and, uh, China is a big country, and uh, if you look at the case of the, uh, the interface for the retail users, so wh whether the interface or the wallet should be offered by the central bank or by the payment companies or by the commercial banks, whether the CBDC should be a claim, direct claim on the central bank, or it should be a claim on, on commercial banks, but backed by the reserve with the central bank. So, so the government needs to make all those kind of uh, choice. And besides, and uh, there are also for the CBDC, there is the offline accessibility problems. And uh, you also need to take this into consideration. Uh, so as far as I can see, the Chinese government wants to uh, adopt a public, private, and a partnership approach. And uh, the Chinese and uh, ECNY is not, necessarily, is not necessarily a direct claim on the central bank. And uh, so it's, it's very similar to how the Hong Kong dollar is issued in Hong Kong. And uh, there are several and a lot of issue banking, three actually, lot of issuing bank in Hong Kong, but backed by the US dollar reserve with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. And uh, so this design is very similar to the ECNY. And because the government wants to make the commercial banks to face the retail users, and wants the commercial banks to take the initi initiative to promote and uh, the adoption of the ECNY. And, uh, and also make, need to make sure that if the commercial bank enough incentive. So I think this all explain why you see the Chinese and uh, Eastern Y has changed in the past several years. But, uh, but we are confident uh, that as this move past the pilot testing stage and uh, more and more uh, part of the Eastern Y will be clear, yeah. So maybe we'll get to try that next year. Yeah. And um, Rob, um, so yeah, Rob, um, so Rob is one of the best like um, observer of both like a um, lot of private initiative and central bank initiative. So what do you think is the correct balance between private entities and central banks when creating the technology for CBDC? And what do you think of the platforms that are currently being offered to central banks to implement CBDCs if they don't want to do it in-house? Yeah, I mean, I think it's still early days. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of different platforms that are being offered as potential solutions for CBDC um, by, you know, private companies. Um, and I think that the issue that I see right now is that a lot of these platforms have been designed for other purposes, and they're being adapted to the CBDC use case. Um, and I think some of the 
fundamentals about CBDC, so security probably being the number one, um, is not like you wouldn't, security is really a question of design, right? As much as anything else. And I think that if you want a secure system, I think security flows from simplicity. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these platforms are very, you know, they have a lot of functionality in them. And I think that if you just take something off the shelf, you can switch the functionality off. But I think that from a security perspective, you may want to design it from scratch without that functionality in it. So I think that for me, and, and you know, it's still relatively early days, you know, different central banks are looking at different platforms and I'm sure they're coming to their own conclusions on it. Um, but I do think you need something that's been specifically designed for the central bank digital currency use case. And I think that, you know, in terms of where's the expertise to do that, obviously, you know, there's some in the private sector, but it's really up to a, a given central bank to decide how they want to construct it um, from those, you know, from those two different pieces. And I think, you know, there's also this, this incentives issue, which I think is something that central banks um, have to consider quite carefully because a lot of these software platforms come with a sort of token baked in, so to speak. And I think, again, that's something that's very difficult for a policymaker to, um, to adopt just because it's sort of an implicit endorsement of whereas this, this, you know, this token, that sort of its value is linked to the software. And like, I don't think a central bank really wants to get involved with that sort of type of speculation, which is sort of what you end up doing if you, if you adopt software that's linked to one of these tokens. So I think that that's another issue that the, the policymakers have to consider. Okay, so speaking of incentives, um, the, the tokens are not the only thing that is um, like the, um, the competitive landscape that is being affected by the choice of central banks. And um, so for the next um, like five to 10 minutes, I would like to see the CBDC and the, the impact on the uh, financial industry. So um, for instance, the, the Chinese two-tier systems um, like let some of the banks, as um, Dr. Zhu, you were saying, um, like distribute CBDC. And um, so, yeah, do you think that it will favor these like bigger banks that have access to CBDC compared to other um, like smaller banks or other firms? And um, to, to Rob, um, is the is this Chicago plan like, um, still being discussed in policy circles? And, and could you just like explain to our audience very quickly what, what the Chicago plan is? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sure people are familiar with uh, Chicago plan um, about you know, to, to make the financial system uh, safer and make set payments safer and whatnot. Um, it has certain effects in terms of lending and its effect on the economy. So it's a much bigger question than uh, like it's around how you do lending in an economy, maturity transformation, and there are trade-offs, right? And I think that for me, that question is separate from CBDC. Um, and it's something that policymakers have to think about when they're thinking about design of the financial system. But, but my, like the, the, the larger issue of like financial stability, obviously the Chicago plan itself, I mean, it's something that's been around for a long time. It has its advocates, um, um, you know, central banks and, policymakers understand what it is and aware of it. Um, I think that it will be a big shift from what we have now. And I think for that reason, you know, it's something that should be separated out uh, from any discussion around CBDC because CBDC is sort of neutral, I would say. Um, you don't have to do anything. You can introduce it. It doesn't imply any particular structure of the financial system. And it doesn't imply anything in terms of competition, right? You can, you know, Policymakers have to decide. I think it has to decide these questions on their own merits and separate them from one another. So I don't think that there's a there's a connection between the two. Uh, okay, and uh, for the for the East and Y, and so uh, East and Y is actually not a, a direct CBDC. It's closer to a, a indirect CBDC or a hybrid CBDC because. Uh, it's essentially an issued by several banks, but backed by their reserve with the central bank. And you can consider ECNY why maybe a claim on the on the issue banks. So, uh, so that, but but however, because they are all equal to M zero, the physical cash issued by the central bank, and the central bank needs to put into regulations just to make sure, and uh, the ECNY. Issued by different banks are 
inter-exchangeable with each other. Uh, so this is very important. So, so that's what, that means uh, and not every bank can be a, an issuer bank for East and Y. And the central bank causes uh, designated operators. Uh, so that means only uh, those banks with very strong capital base and with a large user base uh, can be selected to as uh, designated operators in the East and Y object. So actually this will, um, of course, favor the big banks and the first small banks. And, but this is the case, there's a balance that the central bank has to make. And the first of all is to uh, uh, need to, for the security of the East and West systems. And the other one is how many banks can join these systems. And so I think, uh, I, I think uh, this is a uh, very and uh, unique design, maybe in China. In other countries, um, the central banks will, if CBDC may be a direct claim on the central bank. But, but still, and uh, uh, the commercial banks and the central banks, there will be a wholesale and retail relationship. So I don't think uh, the big bank will still play a, a larger role in distributing CBDC to retail users. Yeah. So thank you so much for the uh, very good talk. And now uh, we have about 10 minutes left and many uh, questions from the audience. So um, I will go to that part, um, but yeah, it was really a great talk and there are many uh, topics we like we haven't covered yet. Um, for instance, now we, we have just seen the impact on CBDC on the financial industry, but um, Dr. Zhu, you were mentioning CBDC like across countries. And so it's, maybe it will affect the global payment systems and the, the way exchange rates work and things like this. Um, but for today, so one of the question of the audience um, was for instance, on what kind of role will the, will the uh, existing e-wallet providers, so he mentioned Alipay, Google Pay, et cetera, play in the implementation of CBDC. Um, so are they competitors of collaborators? So I think the, the Chinese case is a good uh, illustration and answer to the, um, to, 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 um, to this uh, question. So if you can, um, Dr. Zui can answer quickly. Okay, so uh, it depends on regulations. Uh, for example, in China and the payment company like Alipay and WeChat Pay, a lot allowed to uh, offer currency exchange for, for, for customers. So in the past, that means they can't may help the uh, help and the users to make the exchange between physical cash and the bank deposit. Now, uh, in the regarding CBDC, that's that means they can't offer the exchange between bank deposit and the East and Y. So, uh, just taking into the East and Y design of the East and Y, that means the payment company like Alipay and WeChat Pay are not allowed to, uh, be, for example, become a digi uh, digitalized operators. And, uh, and provide wallet service to retail users. But however, so there are, there are now there are two and uh, banks and uh, each uh, affiliate with Alipay and uh, Tencent Pay. And now th those two banks will be uh, designated operators. That means and they will offer and uh, wallet and they will issue East and white to retail users. And, uh, the, the wallets and uh, offered by those two affiliate banks and will be integrated with Alipay and the Tencent Pay apps, yeah. Thank you so much. And um, Rob, so many of the questions revolves around um, the question of transparency. Um, so, and, and in our preparation, we also had privacy that we haven't talked about here, but so yeah, in your mind, how transparent should central bank digital currencies be? Well, I think I would turn the question around and it's like really how private should they be? And I think that the central bank itself um, should want to have a system that is private um, where you can't derive the, um, the payments that are being made by users from the, the ledger itself. So the central bank itself has no insight into what individual users are doing. I think that's extremely important. Um, I think in terms of trans uh, privacy vis-a-vis -vis wallet providers, I think, again, you know, I think um, it's very important that when you are thinking about constructing a system and what regulations do you put in place, I think privacy should be an important part of this because I think there are a lot of business models, certainly today, that are built around these sort of uh, data exhaust, if you want to call it that, 
um, and payments is a potentially very valuable uh, payments data is potentially a very, very valuable resource, and I think there's a great temptation there to surveil the users uh, if if that isn't um, you know. And this this is the same with any system. This is not CBDC um, specific. And when I say that, I, I talk about the wallet providers themselves. When I talk about you know looking at what the users are doing, because obviously if you've got an advertising driven uh, business model, there is a great incentive to you know look at what the users are doing and try and work it out. And for the you know, and the payment element of that is important because when someone makes a payment, that's obviously an important part of a commercial transaction. So I think that given that that is the world um, that we live in today, I think it's very important that when we're dealing with payments is that we have very strong uh, protections for privacy for users. Um, I think that applies equally to the wallet, you know, the, the private sector wallet providers. I think a lot of the privacy discussion revolves around the central bank itself, which is obviously an important part of the discussion, but I think that um, the, the part that gets forgotten about is how much are private uh, companies, you know, respecting the privacy of their users. And I think that's that's almost a, it's almost the forgotten part of the privacy debate sometimes, um, because these are private companies rather than the government itself, that tends to be the, the focus historically in privacy debates. So I think that it's very important to have a system that respects privacy, to have regulations that um, have strong uh, privacy guarantees, and to make sure that users are um, allowed to use the the the, the system um, in a way that respects their privacy. Obviously, there are competing public policy goals around law enforcement. I think they can be achieved in it within the context of a system that that guarantees the privacy of the users. Because of these, obviously, there's these exceptions where the wallet providers may have to, you know, yield to uh, law enforcement. But again, there, there are laws around that. You know, there are laws around when, and, and, and all this stuff already exists, right? So like if people, for people who have bank accounts and debit cards and credit cards, like that data is subject to, you know, if law enforcement wants to see it for whatever reason, then there's, there's laws around, you know, you can get a court order and you can go and see it. And obviously it varies from country, country to country, but there's a procedure around that. And I think, again, it shouldn't just be, you know, there should be very strictly defined and controlled um, uh, reasons why you you know why why you would ever disturb the privacy of the end users because that I think is the is the primary um, you know principle is that people should be allowed to use any system I mean this goes beyond CBDC any system uh, and have their privacy preserved because I think it's just a sort of fundamental human right. Thank you so much. And so yeah, we can see some of the. Um the tensions or policy trade-offs, as, as you were mentioning, between the privacy part and the, and the, and the central bank uh, part. And um, one of the example of um, how like the, the, the uh, People's Banks of China in, is it's trying to tackle this problem is, is to use the, the term uh, controllable privacy, for instance. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that, that will be my next question for, for both of you. Um, so, for, for Dr. Zhu, maybe like um, just explain what, what this controllable privacy means. And uh, for Rob, so you were mentioning um, like for the private um, like tech providers that they have a lot of functionalities and, and things like this. And uh, are some of these functionalities linked to um, like encryption and privacy or, or are they linked to like, like the functionalities are, are aimed at other things? Uh, okay. And, uh... Uh, so I think this will maybe become uh, and the new normal in this retail CBDC area. And uh, so if you take all the cons and the requirements of AML, uh, KYC, and uh, and the CFT into considerations, uh, I don't think any uh, retail CBDC can be fully anonymous. So that's actually the uh, so different country will have different design to. Uh, to fulfill the requirement, the regulation requirements, and in China that means if you want to open a an Eastern Wire wallet, and you need to go through a KYC process, uh, you need you need to supply some of your uh, information and uh, personal information, and uh, but but you can be uh, still can be and uh, and uh, fully anonymous, but however you will you will be allowed to own uh, maybe uh, a limited amount of Eastern Wire. Uh, and the Eastern Y and uh, that cash. And so, uh, even it has a, so if Eastern Y has a KYC process, but, but for, the, for the front end, 
for the for the commercial banks, for the for the merchants, for the users and uh, between users, and uh, they are anonymous. Yeah. So just a just a balance and between the anonymity and also uh, regulation compliance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that I sort of covered this in my previous answer, but I think that um, privacy is extremely important. And I think users of any system, uh, any digital system, including CBDC, are entitled to expect it. Uh, and I think the technology can provide it. Uh, and I think the circumstances in which, uh, you know, as I said, um, the, when the correct legal uh, procedure has been gone through, uh, they should be very limited. So I think for me, you know, the privacy of the of the user is is paramount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, when I was asking this question on uh, the other functionalities of uh, like the tech providers um, of of like um, the, the the technology behind CBDC, I, I actually had in mind like um, the notion of programmable money that you like that Rob you you wrote about um, a lot. So. Um, yeah, could you describe a little bit like what would this like um, programmable money would be and how, how they could help like CBDC achieve like some of the policy goals central banks have? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's really about like this goes to what, you know, what's the, what's the financial system going to look like in the future? Because this is really what this is all about. I mean, CBDC is a, you know, is a particular specific issue, but it's all about what's the you know, future financial system going to look like. And I think you know, we should look for a much more efficient uh, financial system. Um, and I think part of that is greater automation as with any, as with any industry, if you want higher productivity, automation is one of the, mm -hmm. you know, is one of the important factors in that. And I think programmability allows you to do a lot more um, automation. And I think that's, that's the beneficial part of it. And then I think when you look, you know, when you look at um, uh, the relationship of the financial system to the rest of the economy. I think obviously it's there to serve the rest of the economy. Uh, and I think the better it can do, the more it can do uh, with less, I think is, uh, is important. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. programmability sort of moves you in, the, in that direction. And I think there's, you know, so it's obviously connected with questions of what is the role of artificial intelligence in the future of the financial system? And I think all these questions are linked together. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So today we talk mostly about retail CBDC, but as uh, Dr. Zhu mentioned at the start, there's, there's also this huge part of wholesale CBDC. And um, like the way you describe your, like the programmable money, maybe it applied more to the, the wholesale side, like the automating, like the financial system and things like this. So um, um, yeah, it's actually questions for both of you. So um, would you, do you have some like examples or instances of markets like in which like um, such automation would really contribute to solve problems? Um, and Dr. Zhu, you mentioned um, cross-border payments and uh, for instance, but it seems like um, like the, the ECNY for now, it, it has not like never been advertised to, uh, if I'm not wrong, to, um, to be used for like, wholesale and for cross-border. Um, so what, what do you think is that um, it's, it's, it hasn't been like as, as part of the ECMI objectives and, uh, and is that something that could change? So I know there are a lot of questions in there. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so for ECMI, the, uh, the Chinese Central Bank has conducted a, a test with the Hong Kong Multiple Authority uh, for the cross-border use. And, I think, and uh, so when everything okay, and uh, so the Chinese Central Bank will offer ECNY to foreign users mm -hmm. and allow foreign users to install an ECNY wallet and uh, to own and use ECNY. Uh, but, the, but the size or amount of this ECNY cross-border payments will be, I think will be very limited because it's just for retail users. and. So for the wholesale part, and uh, so we need to take into consideration that even, even for in the, in the two tier and the uh, operation models, even and uh, if a retail and the CBDC has a wholesale component between the central bank and the commercial banks. And, but, but most of those, the wholesale and the CBDC is used for uh, pros and uh, for example, in the security transactions and uh, post-trade processing 
and in the cross-border payment and uh, between the two uh, commercial banks of different countries. And so, uh, so for example, in the uh, in the in the multi CBDC pro bridge project, and uh, the Chinese central bank will work, offer work with uh, three other central banks, and in the payment uh, cross-border payment test. And so I think it will be extended to uh, to both the cross-border payments and the wholesale part. And and I just mentioned uh, and the programmability. Uh, this is actually a very and uh, interesting part for wholesale and the CBDC pilot testings, because uh, for example in the security transactions and uh, uh, there will be uh, so one leg is about is about the payment of of, of money. The second leg is about the settlement of securities. So if they and operate in different and uh, blockchain systems, and you need to and uh, coordinate and between them. So there's a requirement for DVP, delivery first as a payment. So it, so it is it has very high requirement for uh, cross ledger trans and uh, technologies like the hash time lock contract. Uh, so, and also in the wholesale and CBDC project, because they, they want to save liquidities, uh, there are also lots of uh, use for programmability through smart contract here. Yeah, I agree. Uh, like delivery versus payment, payment versus yeah. payment, these types of uh, functions, I think, are uh, something that you would, you would want to um, implement uh, as part of your programmability. Okay, so we are running toward the end of our talk, um, but I, I thought that in the three, four minutes that, that is left, um, maybe you can like share with um, the audience like some of the resources that they can turn to if, if they like want to explore more. So David, you, you mentioned, for instance, um, like the BIS and like innovation submit from last week. Yeah. Um, your, your own like, um, like, like social media has like a lot of like great articles that you wrote and Rob, you also published many great papers on programmable money. So if you could just like share other uh, reading lists or materials for, for the audience uh, who would be interested in deepening the topic. Uh, so I would recommend it as a working papers of the BIS. And uh, I think now the, the research department of BIS is at the frontier of the uh, CBDC research, and because the BIL is also and uh, joining with several central banks, and uh, to do a uh, testing, uh, to do a uh, research on CBDC, including the Federal Reserve and the uh, Bank of England and the uh, ECP. Yeah, uh, I see lots of very good ideas come from the BIS, and and also and uh, uh, some central banks very active in these areas, and uh, like. Uh, for example, um, Bank of England and, uh, and the East European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve, and they also have those very good and uh, working papers. Mm -hmm. And of course, yeah, and the MIT, there are some very good professors also doing this kind of research, uh, like Professor Robert Thompson. Robert Thompson, yeah, I, I think you can uh, follow their uh, their website. Yeah, they are very good. Lots of very good reading materials. Yeah. And of course, the DCI, <laughs> yeah, the, the research report uh, provided by DCI. You need to follow very closely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, would, I would agree. DCI, obviously, we've got to, got to, got to give shouts to DCI. Um, Central Bank's website's pretty good. Um, yeah. uh, BIS, David's mentioned. Um, one that didn't come up, uh, the Netherlands Central Bank is pretty good. They did a report last year uh, about this, which I think is definitely worth reading. Um, and then um, one, I will give a, I'll give a book recommendation. It's actually from about 30 years ago. It's called The Evolution of Central Banks by Charles Goodhart, which is from MIT Press. And that doesn't talk about CBDC per se, but it talks about the evolution of central banking. And if anyone wants a sort of nice, readable, um, short book about central banking and to think about where it came from, where central banks came from and what they do, that's a very helpful resource to sort of give you a good foundation for thinking about CBDC. Okay, great. Thank you. For, uh, thank you to you both. And um, 
I'll give the floor back to Gabriel for the rest of the MIT Bitcoin Expo. Hope you enjoy it. Great. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rob.